Hello and welcome to this exploring session where we're looking at Royster Doister by Nicholas Udall, uh, often called Ralph Royster Doister, or maybe it's pronounced Rafe Royster Doister. That's something we're going to play around with today as we, we constantly go down the Rafe Ralph axis of possibility. Um, and um, it's a play from around 1552 with probable uh, revisions maybe the following years during the reign of Queen Mary. It gets printed uh, during uh, the reign of Queen Elizabeth around 1566-67. So it's about in this sort of 10, 15 year axis of, uh, of, of performance slash publishing and then has uh, I think a, a reasonably good uh, survival in cultural memory uh, after that as well. Reading through the first act or two uh, today is reading the prologue, Harpax and Truepenny. Hi, I'm Francis Cox. I'm an actor living in Amsterdam. Uh, reading Tibbet, Talkapace and Custance today is... Hi, I'm Lynn. Uh, I'm a writing teacher coming to you from the northwestern United States. And reading Anot Aliface today is... Hello, I'm Eric, and I put my mic over there by accident, but it's, you know, I'll move it in a minute. Excellent. Um, for those at home who are worrying about the presence or absence of Eric's microphone, it, it is safe and no harm will come to it. Uh, reading Merry Greek today is... <laughs> Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director, and I live in Germany. And today, reading uh, Dominic Downty uh, is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott. I'm neither an actor nor an academic, but I'm still based in South London. And reading Rafe or Ralph Royster, the doister himself, is... Hi, I'm Valentina, and I'm an actor and voiceover artist in London. And finally, reading the fabulously named Marjorie Mumblecrust, appearing on Great British Bake Off very soon, is... Hello, I'm Helen Good, I'm a historian, and I'm in London. And uh, I'm your host, Robert Crichton, and I am reading Nobody. I may read the occasional stage direction. There aren't that many. Um, it's uh, a play written out in five acts in its structure. It has various scenes, which are pretty much the continuation of the previous scene. The scene convention here is pretty much for exits and entrances, or major entrances and exits, rather than necessarily separate units of action but we will attempt to navigate that as we go the play opens with a prologue so uh, if i can ask the prologue to prologue please what creature is in health either young or old but some mirth with modesty will be glad to use as we in this interlude shall now unfold wherein all scarity scarility we utterly refuse avoiding such mirth wherein is abuse knowing nothing more commendable for a man's recreation than mirth which is used in an honest fashion. For mirth prolongeth life and causeth, he and causeth health. Mirth re recreates our spirits and voideth pensiveness. Mirth increases, increaseth amity, not hindering our wealth. Mirth is to be used both of more and less, being mixed with virtue and decent comeliness. As we trust no good nature can gainsay the same, which mirth we intend to use, all avoiding all blame. The wise poets, long time heretofore, under merry comedies secrets did declare, wherein was contained very virtuous law, with mysteries and forewarnings very rare. Such to write neither Plautus nor Terence did spare, which among the learned at this day bears the bell. These, these with such other therein did excel. Our comedy or interlude, which we intend to play, is named Royster Doister indeed, which against the vain glorious, glorious doth invade, whose humour the roisting sort continually doth feed. Thus, by your patience, we intend to proceed in this our interlude, by God's leave and grace, and here I take my leave for a certain space and exit the prologue um so yeah it's gonna be there's gonna be mirth the mirth is gonna avoid your pensiveness 
Uh, I often like to avoid my pensiveness, um, and uh, it, it's it's not a serious thing. Um, you know, it's it's good to have fun. Um, you know, we've got some classical examples why it's fine. So you know, if they did it in the distant past, then then it, it's obviously fine. Uh, this isn't the first time we've had a prologue pointing out that the play is just going to be a bit of fun and that it's fine to have fun and fun is fine. Um, possibly by the same author, it appears in uh, Jack Juggler as an opening oration there as well. And it feels very, very similar to this and is possibly by the same author. Opinions vary, but it does feel to me very, very similar. Thoughts in the room about this little prologue? Uh, Sarah? It better be funny. <laughs> Try descriptions act. Yeah, because <laughs> you know they've just built up our expectations now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Helen. Yes, it's interesting that he's talk talks about other plays, which presumably he's talking about other plays which are either scurrilous or contain very very serious hidden warnings. Hmm. So this is a this is a commentary on the the plays of the day. Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's a statement of intent from this author. You're not you're not going to get secret secret uh, mysteries and forewarnings very rare here. Oh no 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 we don't do that here. You're going to have fun, uh, which as Sarah says, dangerous proposition to state in the prologue. <laughs> You can just imagine the whole of the front row folding their arms and going, go on then, make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, you can see the aisle seats tipping up in Bolton, can't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, any other thoughts before we get into the meat of the play itself? Uh, Eric? It's short and sweet, uh, so it kind of doesn't really... I mean, it's kind of... By this point, you kind of assume that people would get bored quickly of long prologues. So they just kind of launch straight into the action without launching into it quite basically. Okay, scene is set. Uh, we will move into the first scene then. So it's labeled as Act One, Scene One. Enter Matthew Merry Greek. <laughs> As long as liveth the merry man, they say, as doth the sorry man, and longer by a day. Yet the grasshopper, for all his summer piping, starveth in winter with hungry griping. Therefore another said, so doth men advise, that they be together both merry and wise. This lesson must I practice, or else ere long with me, Matthew Merry Greek, it will be wrong. Indeed, men so call me, for by him that us bought, whatever chance betide, I can take no thought. Yet wisdom would that I did myself bethink where to be provided this day of meat and drink. For know ye that, for all this merry note of mine, he might oppose me now that should uh, ask where I dine. <laughs> My living lieth here and there, of God's grace, sometime with this good man, sometime in that place. Sometime Lewis Loiterer biddeth me come near, some, some whiles Watkin Woster maketh good, us good cheer. Sometime David Ice player, when he hath well cast, maketh revel rout as long as it will last. Sometime Tom Tittyville maketh us a feast. Sometime with Sir Hugh Pye I am a bidden guest. Sometime at Nickel Never Thrives I get a sop. Sometime I am feasted with Brian Blinkensop. Sometime I hang on Hankin Hoddy Doddy's sleeve, but this day on Ralph Royster Doysters by his leave. For truly of all men, he is my chief banker, both for meat and money, and my chief shoot anchor. Forsooth, Royster Doyster, in that he doth say, and require what ye will, ye shall have no nay. But now of Royster Doyster, somewhat to express, that he may esteem him after his worthiness. In these twenty towns, and seek him throughout, 
is not the like stock whereon to grow a lout. All the day long he is facing and creaking of his great acts in fighting and fray-making. But when Royster Doyster is put to his proof, to keep the queen's peace is more for his behoof. If any woman smile or cast him an eye, up is he to the hard ears in love by and by. And in all the hot haste must she be his wife, else farewell his good days and farewell his life. Master Ralph Royster Doyster is but dead and gone, except she on him takes some compassion. Then chief of council must be Matthew Merry Greek. What if I for marriage to such a one seek? Then must I sooth it, whatever it is, for what he saith or doth cannot be amiss. Hold by his yea and nay, be his noun white son, praise and rouse him well, and ye have his heart won. For so welketh he, for so well liketh he his own fond fashions, that he taketh pride of false commendations. But such sport have I with him, as I would not lease, though I should be bound to live with bread and cheese. For exalt him, and have him as ye lust indeed, yea, to hold his finger in a hole for a need. I can with a word make him feign or loath. I can with as much make him pleased or wroth. I can, when I will, make him merry and glad. I can, when me lust, make him sorry and sad. I can set him up in hope and eke in despair. I can make him speak rough and I can make him speak fair. But I marvel I see him not all this same day. I will seek him out. Oh, but lo, he cometh this way. I have yon espied him, sadly coming. And in love for 20 pound by his gloaming. I'm just going to briefly pause there. We will be going into quite a lengthy scene in just a moment. So uh, I think it's important to just, just take a step into who Merry Greek is and who he thinks Ralph. Rafe Royster Doyster is. Um, he doesn't have much of a high opinion of, uh, of his uh, victim, um, as I think we should call him. Uh, <laughs> we were doing cons the other day. Um, this, is, um, this is a sort of parasite figure inveigling himself on, on, onto, onto uh, uh, Royster Doyster's um, um, view of himself as well. I think there's something really interesting there about mm -hmm. um, the, the, the sort of the view that or the name he's given himself or he has for himself, how much that connects with reality is an interesting question that you put forward there. Thoughts about this opening speech? Uh, Eric. Well, I was going to say that, like, just as, you know, we said that the prologue was short and sweet, well, we obviously get like this long, <laughs> long piece of text for um, Matt, uh, Matthew Merry Greek, which is kind of like, not the opposite, but it's just like, why did they want the prologue in the first place, kind of? Hmm. Well, the prologue does seem to be quite a formal thing, whereas this is very much opening gambit stand-up, isn't it? Mm. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's quite engaging in that sense. Um, uh, the, I have other thoughts on this, but I don't want to say anything yet. Uh, other thoughts in the room, uh, Lynn? Yeah, the material is kind of redundant, though, with the prologue. One of the functions of the prologue is to signal genre um, and and character types. You know, they the uh, prologue invokes Terence and Plautus, the you know the the classical comedy writers, and then talks about making fun of people who are vainglorious. So you're like, oh, classical comedy with the miles gloriosus. Uh, type character okay that's what i'm set for and then again mary mary greek talks about how he's always bragging about his exploits and starting fights and stuff like that so yeah, yeah we already know that that he's like that the prologue told us that so yeah um, i i, I want I, good audience. <laughs> I, I do wonder about the, the the way the prologue is telling us how we're supposed to react to the material as opposed to this just being the material 
And yes. I've seen that in other prologues where, where it's almost like if you tell the audience how to react, they're more likely to do it, perhaps, in the thought of the, uh, of the author. I'm just wondering if that's the logic. Uh, you're right, it is a bit redundant. It's not the most important prologue in the universe. It, that I, did... Oh, oh uh, Helen first. On, Helen. Yeah, I like the list of the other people that he dines with. Mm. Um, presumably none of these people make an entrance. I did, no, no, they, they, mm. they are a list. They are a list for effect. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and uh, yes, if you go with all the other lists for effect we've had in other plays, uh, Sarah. I was going to say reading that, it felt like a prologue. It, 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 it felt like a, um, it was him basically coming on, setting the scene. So it, yeah, I guess maybe... I mean, maybe the prologue was there because it, you know, what's his name, Udall, he felt that it needed a, a, a formal prologue because maybe, you know, that's what plays had. Um, but this is, this to me is like, yeah, this is the start of the play and he sets the scene and he lays it all out and he uh, draws the audience in and that to me is the function of the prologue. Yeah, well, I think this is this is as much about character as it, as as about plot. I I, I mm, think that's the yeah. important thing. It's about the relationship between Mary Greek and uh, and Royster. Um, I think the 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 formal prologue is as much a shut up and here's you know <laughs> settle the room down before you start the play. Otherwise, my, otherwise Mary Greek would have to start with a oi oi, uh, oi um, kind of mode, which I don't think he does. Um, no. He does thought, come in with a song, doesn't he? But I, yes, I, I forgot to read that stage direction. I do apologise. So he probably was singing before he spoke, though you managed to uh, attempt to transposition. I just so nice. <laughs> make it up as you know. Yeah. Yeah. Do a bit and then stop. Um, yeah, uh, Lynn. Yeah, who who knows something about the name Mary Greek? Is that kind of a cultural stereotype that Greeks were Mary? There's a a phrase in another a much later early modern play she's a merry greek indeed uh that's a, a coincidence if it's just a coincidence so there's something about greeks being married in, in the culture that we can document i wouldn't be surprised if the later play was referring to this character uh <laughs> rather than to a wider cultural point i don't i genuinely don't know i i, I haven't come across anything as of yet on it uh helen I think it's very unlikely that it refers to a, a, a person of Greek nationality. Mm. Um, I, I think it's. Um, Ooh, I, I think it. It. I think it'll be another word altogether, which I will work on and let you know when I, I found I, it. I found a footnote finally that uh, oh. it's. Um, it's. Uh, it uh, seems to be Udall's own coinage as a name, um, according to this footnote. Um, it could indicate, uh, it could be more Greek or Grig, uh, to indicate a dwarf, a hen, an eel, or possibly a cricket. So, uh, lots of options have been put there in this uh, footnote, which is suggesting the footnote doesn't really know either. Um, so Mary Grig is the word I was after because I've seen Mary Grig elsewhere. Mm. So, Mary, Mary Chap, um, is, is well, the gloss. The uh, physically small which which clowns often were well it's quite po probably a boy for the the context of this uh, these are probably uh, performed by by young people it's highly probable uh alan i'm just wondering whether there's link knowing knowing what we do about the background of oodle whether in fact you've got some sort of um set up here of ralph being set up as being one of the sporty types in within the school and Mary Greek as, as being a scholar. Um, I, d I don't know if that precise outline, but certainly the figures within a school logic <coughs> could fit well. Yes, uh, Sarah. Um, that thing about him, about it possibly referring to a cricket, I mean, that would fit because he does talk right at the beginning of his monologue about, uh, you know, the, the fable of the, um, the, the cricket, uh, the grasshopper rather. I mean, he, he is, and he says, you know, I'm going to be merry and wise. He is basically the grasshopper who loafs all summer and then come the winter rather than dying, he just goes and moves in with someone else. Yeah. So, I mean, it does, it would fit really, really nicely. Mm. 
Uh, for those, um, uh, just before we go on to read more, uh, just uh, a note, referring back again to uh, Jack Juggler, which increasingly I just feel is by the same author. I'm, 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 I'm increasingly becoming quite definite on that front, uh, which we've done on the podcast. You can listen to a full cast audio adaptation, which is available. Um, uh, and now I'll put you off that uh, link. Uh, is That's a play that opens with three opening speeches, which are about four times longer than this. It takes about half an hour before people talk to each other um, in, in, the, in the text. Uh, they're, they're good speeches, but there's three of them. And I think that's an earlier play. And I think this is the condensed version. So if you feel this was a bit long, trust me, trust me, you wrote longer. <laughs> anyway, we now have extended dialogue um, and uh, we're going to let this run. So uh, Rafe Royster Doyster, as uh, he now appears in my uh, original spelling. Uh, 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 so he's spelt both ways, just to confuse everyone. So Rafe Royster Doyster and Mer Matthew Merry Greek are on stage. Come, death, when thou wilt, I'm weary of my life. I told you, I, we should woo another wife. Why did God make me such a goodly person? He is in by the week. We shall have sport anon. And where is my trusty friend, Matthew Merigreek? I will make as I saw him not. He doth me seek. I have him inspired. Methinketh yond he is he. Oh, Matthew Merigreek, my friend, a word with thee. I will not hear him, but make I as I had haste. Uh, farewell, all my good friends, the time away doth waste, and the tide they say tarrieth for no man. Thou must with thy good counsel help me, if thou can. Oh, God keep thee, worshipful Master Royster Doyster, and farewell, the lusty Master Royster Doyster. I must needs speak with thee a word or twain. Oh. Within a month or two, I will be here again. Negligence in great affairs, you know, may mar all. Attend upon me now, and well reward thee I shall. I have to take my leave, and the tide is well spent. I die except thou help. I pray thee be content. Do they part well now, and ask what thou wilt, for without thy aid my matter is all split. Then to serve your turn, I will some pains take and let all mine own affairs alone for your sake. My whole hope of trust resteth in only thee. Then can ye not do amiss, whatever it be? Oh, gramercy, Mary Greek, most bound to thee I am. But up with that heart, and speak out like a ram. Ye speak like a capon that had the cough now. Be of good cheer, anon you shall do well enow. Upon thy comfort I will all things well handle. So low, that is a breast to blow out a candle. Uh, but what is this great matter I would fain know? Oh, we shall find remedy thereof, I trow. Uh, do ye lack money? Ye you know mine old offers. Ye have always a key to my purse and coffers. I thank thee, had ever men such a friend. <sighs> Ye give unto me, I must needs to you lend. Nay, I have money plenty, all things to discharge. That knew I right well, when I made offer so large. But it is no such matter. What is it then? Are ye in danger of debt to any man? If ye be, take no thought, nor be not afraid. Let them hardly take thought how they shall be paid. That I all know. What then? Fear ye imprisonment? No. No. I wish ye offend not so to be shent, but if ye have the tower, could not you so hold? But to break out at all times ye would be bold. Uh, what is it? Hath any man threatened you to beat? Huh? What is it that dost have put me in that heat? He that beath of me by his arms shall well find that I will not be far from him, nor run behind. That thing know all men. Ever since he overthrew the fellow of the lion, which uh, uh, Hercules slew. Uh, but what is it then? Of love I make my moan. Ah, this foolish love wilt ne'er let us alone. But 
Because you were refused the last day, you said you would ne'er more be entangled that way. I would meddle no more, since I find all so unkind. Yea, but I cannot so put love out of my mind. But is your love, tell me first, in any wise in the way of marriage or of merchandise? If it may be otherwise than lawful be found, you get none of my help for a hundred pound. No, by my troth, I would have her to my wife. Then are ye a good man, and God save your life. And uh, what or who is she with whom ye are in love? A woman whom I know not by what means to move. Who is it? A woman yond. What is her name? A yonder. Whom? Mistress, um... Fie, fie, for shame, love ye, and know not whom, but her yond, a woman. We shall then get you a wife, I cannot tell when. The fair woman that supped with us yesternight, and I heard her name twice or thrice, and had it right. Yea, ye may see ye ne'er take me to good cheer with you. If ye had, I could have told you her name now. I was to blame indeed, but the next time perchance, and she dwelleth in this house. What? Christian Custance? Except I have her to my wife, I, I shall run mad. Nay, unwise perhaps, but I warrant you for mad. I am utterly dead unless I have my desire. Where be the bellows that blew this sudden fire? I hear she's worth a thousand pound and more. Yea, but learn this one lesson of me afore. An hundred pound of marriage money, doubtless, is ever thirty pound sterling, or somewhat less, so that her thousand pound, if she be thrifty, is much near about two hundred and fifty. Howbeit, woos and widows are never poor. Is she a widow? Oh, I love her better therefore. But I hear she hath made promise to another. He shall go without her, and he were my brother. Mm, I have heard say, I am right well advised, that she hath to Gawain good luck promise, promise said. What? Ah, what is that Gawain good luck? A merchant man. Shall he speed her for me? Nay, sir, by sweet Saint Anne. Ah, sir. Becker, quod Mortimer to his sow, I will have her mine own self, I make God a vow, for, I tell thee, she's worth a thousand pound. Yet a fitter wife for your marship might be found. Such a goodly man as you might get one with land, besides pounds of gold, a, a thousand and a thousand and a thousand and a thousand and a thousand, and so to the sum of twenty hundred thousand. Your most goodly personage is worthy of no less. I am sorry God made me so comely, doubtless, uh, for that maketh me each wear so highly favoured, and all women on me so enamoured. Enamoured, quod you. Have ye spied that out? Ah, <laughs> oh, sir, marry, now I see you know what is what. Enamoured, ah, oh. marry, sir, say that again. But I thought not ye had marked it so plain. Oh, yes, each one they gaze all upon me and stare. Yea, Malkin, I warrant you, as much as they dare. And ye will not believe what they say in the street when your marshal passeth, passeth by, all such as I meet, that sometimes I can scarce find what answer to make. Who is this? saith one. Sir Launcelot du Lake. Who is this? Great Guy of Warwick, saith another. No, say I, it is the thirteenth Hercules, brother. Who is this, noble Hector of Troy, saith the third? No, but of the same nest, say I, it is a bird. Who is this, great Goliath, Samson or Colbrand? No, say I, but it is a brute of the ally land. Who is this, great Alexander or Charlemagne? No, it is the tenth worthy, say I to them again. I know not if I said well. Yes, for so I am. Yea, for there were but nine worthies before ye came. To some others, the third Cato, I do you call. And so, as well as I can, 
I answer them all. Sir, I pray you, what lord or great gentleman is this? Master Ralph Royster Doisterdame, say I. Eh, wis. Oh, Lord, saith she then, what a goodly man it is. Would Christ I had such a husband as he is. Oh, Lord, say some, that the sight of his face we lack. It is, an, it is enough for you, say I, to see his back. His face is for ladies of high and noble parages, with whom he hardly scapeth great marriages, with much more than this, and uh, much otherwise. I can thank thee uh, th that thou canst such answers devise, but I perceive thou dost me uh, thoroughly know. I mark your manners for mine own learning, I trow. But such is your beauty, and such are your acts, such is your personage, and such are your facts, that all women, fair and foul, more and less, they are you, they love you, they talk of you, doubtless. Your pleasant look maketh them all merry. Ye pass not by, but they laugh, <laughs> till they be weary. Yea, money could I have to tell truth to the truth to tell of many, to bring you that way where they dwell. Merry Greek, for these they're reporting well of me. Oh, what should I else, sir? Tis my duty, Poddy. I promise thou shalt not lack, while I have a groat. Faith, sir, and I ne'er had more need of a new coat. Thou shalt have one tomorrow, and gold for to spend. Then I trust to bring the day to a good end. For, for as for my own part, having money and no, I could live only with the remembrance of you. But now to your widow, whom you love so hot. By cock thou says truth, I had almost forgot. What if Christian customs will not have you? What? Have me? Yes, I warrant you, never doubt of that. I know she loveth me, but she dare not speak. Indeed, meet it for somebody should it break. She looked on me twenty times yesternight and laughed so. <laughs> that she could not sit upright. No, Faith, could she not? No, even such a thing I cast. But for wooing, thou knowest women are shamefast. But, um, and she knew my mind, I know she would be glad and think it the best chance that ever she had. To her then, like a man, and be bold forth to start. Wooers never speed well that have a false heart. What may I best do? Sir, remain ye a while here. Ere long, one or other of her house will appear. You know my mind? Yeah, now hardly. Let me alone. In the meantime, sir, if you please, I will home and call your musicians. For in this your case, it would set you forth and all your wooing grace. It may not lack your instruments to play and sing. Thou knowest I can do that. As well as anything. Shall I go call your folks that we may show a cast? Yeah, run, I beseech thee, in all possible haste. I go. And indeed he does. Exit Mary Greek. Yeah, for I love singing out of measure. It comforteth my spirits and doth me great pleasure. But who come forth yond from my sweetheart customs? My matter frameth well. This is a lucky chance. But before we go on to the entrance of lots of other characters, let's just uh, briefly unpack that. Uh, what a fun little scene that was. So much potential. Yes. What I really like about the plays that are broadly ascribed to Udall is that they all come with games actors can play. Mm -hmm. We know what the game, the two, you know, what Mary Greek is doing to, uh, to, to Ralph. We know what his delusions are and how he might play up to those. And so it just creates huge amounts of potential for what you do with this scene. Um, I think you thought you both caught on to the game very, very quickly as well. So the script is communicating that to you very directly in a way that I, I think works uh, really nicely. Um, all of that extended, oh, this is what the women were saying. Oh, they thought you were so wonderful. Oh, and you, you know, uh, you know the tenth worthy. Um, <laughs> and um, remember, the, the, uh, as part of various civic uh, pageantry demonstrations, you, you might actually have the nine worthies being presented as, as epic 
massive events that uh, so so you know this is this is something that people would pick up on not just on a sort of classical level but actually as something that you know people on the street might even know about um uh thoughts in the room how how was it how was um how was uh, royster doistering for you valentina <laughs> Oh my god, it's so much fun. I think like this is, I mean, it would be a fun part to play for anyone, but I think like for a woman, because it's such a typical man, I mean, in the worst possible way, but it's so typical straight man. <laughs> he can't oh, even great. remember her name. Yeah. No, no, I know. No. <laughs> oh, I was, I and then he goes like, go, like all up his own ass and like being wonderful and whatever. And then he turns around and goes like, yeah, but you know, I'm not like, um, actually you, you know me too well. Like, sorry. Like, like why are you like, <laughs> like yeah. I'm flattered, but um, not inclined that way. It's, it's just ridiculous. And then he forgets they, what, why he was, was there for. It's just, it's amazing. Mm. Uh, Francis. Yeah, I was puzzled uh, by the fact that um, Royster Doyster is after um, Christian Custance's thousand pounds a year, where by his own admission and uh, Mary Greek's uh, talking about his generosity, he doesn't seem to be that short of money. Money likes more money. It always likes more money. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mon mon money, money, like likes the, the, likes to go like that and and and, mm, and, and grow yeah. uh, and produce yeah. more children. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Helen, there's a couple of things. Um, looking at the merry Greek speech, starting "Yea, Malkin, I warrant you," um, I think that is mastership. Yeah, I, I think it, it was. I, I, I think it should be, I, I mean, I've been trying to work on the rhythm of the, the line. I think it probably should be. And then further down, brute, that should have a capital B. Mm, yes, it should. This isn't a brute. This is the brute, yeah. the founder of Br Britain. Uh, mm. um, what, though, is Ally Land? Uh, well, oh, I, I took it to be an ally, like an allied land to... Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's obviously got to rhyme with Colbrand, a giant. Mm. Yeah. Brute of the alley. I mean, it should be England or Britain or something. Mm. Yeah, I took it to mean that, like, yeah, he's not, he's not, um, he's not Goliath or Samson, or he's not, he's, he's not one of those, you know, biblical heroes, but he's, he's a, he's a he's a brute of, of an of an allied land i wasn't taking it i didn't realize it was meant to be brutus i was taking it meaning he was like a hero of a another land close to where goliath and samson and they all lived yes you so have identi mm -hmm. you've identified the point that the footnote is also deeply un un uncertain about <laughs> um, so, um, you know, good old footnote it could be a bit like um a bit like albion but it's not really it could be a bit like holy land but it doesn't really work there mm. either it ba basically just goes it sort of doesn't seem to work <laughs> sarah um following on from the master um ship what the mass ship the mashup. I mean, yeah. I pronounced that mashup because I assumed it was mastership that was, you know, just it's contracted. It's a contraction. I, I, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it turns out. But so, yeah, because I've seen it before. I'm sure I've come across it before in, in these plays. But should I actually, even though it's a contraction, should I actually be pronouncing the whole thing as mastership? I just assumed I, I should pronounce it as a contraction. I assumed it was a contraction. Um, okay. um, just... Uh, that that seems to be how it goes, and un unless it obviously scans better as being mastership, but um, um, that's that's one for rehearsal. Well, I was I was sort of trying to scan it, and it yeah. seemed to me that it should be mastership. I don't know. Yeah. I've never heard mastership. Oh yeah, no, we've we've had around it. about now in this sort of time. Uh, we've, uh, we've I know I've mastership. Yeah, I've only come across it once before because I haven't, you know. But I know there's definitely been another play where I've had. I've had a mashup or I've read a mashup. Yeah. For sure. I I'm can't sure. remember which one. Like Yeah, we no, we've de we've definitely had lots of mashups. Um uh, as as it were. Um <laughs> other thoughts. Um I I do love the lub. Uh, uh the she loves you. 
Um, I know that, you know, it was a variation, but uh, it does have a delightful just quality of just being sickening. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn. I, oh, yeah, I, I, I know she loves me. She looked at me and, and kept laughing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I love that so much. That was so much fun. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of very good blog speeches about um, you look so merrily that you make everybody, uh, the, the ladies laugh when they see yeah. you. Yeah. But, oh, Royster Deister's cluelessness is, is yeah, it's meter pegging. <laughs> yeah. Sarah. I mean, what I thought was interesting about that was the first, at the beginning of the scene, there are actual asides written into the uh, text, we you know, where he's, he's doing it to the audience. But as I was reading that, I kept, like, once I just finished a line, I kept thinking, oh, that should have been an aside to the audience. That the, there seemed to be a lot more of them mm. sprinkled through the text that weren't actually marked um, with stage directions as such. But I, it, it seemed to be like almost like a, at times like a two way conversation. Like he's talking to Ralph Royster Joyster and then he's saying to the audience, this guy is such an ass, he doesn't even realize. Yeah, like, the, and it the, was. The, there's a lot of potential there. I, I, the, the, the text is, like, is quite untidy in various ways as to where some of those live. So mm. I think only the really obvious overt ones are labelled as asides. It would be fun to find them, though, in yeah. rehearsal. Like, it would be good to like pull them all out and, yeah, fun. fun. So yes, um, well, I think we all know where we are. Let's uh, let's throw some more spanners into the works, as it were. Not that I'm suggesting these are spanners, um, but um, other characters to confuse and uh, uh, poor poor Royster. Um, so uh, again, um, interesting st sort of stage directions. They're not really helpful stage directions. So Act One, Scene Three, as it's labelled, uh, Madge mumble crust spinning on the distaff. Tibbet talk pace sewing, and Annette's alley face or ale face knitting Ralph Royster behind. Don't know how any of that happened. <laughs> okay. So, Is this... Yes, sorry. Uh, so st dialogue then happens. <laughs> if this distaff was stung, spun, Marjorie mumble crust. Where good stale ale is, we'll drink no water, I trust. Dame Custance hath promised us good ale and white bread. If she keep not promise, I will be shrew her head. But it will be stark night before I shall have done. I will stand here a while and talk with them anon. I hear them speak of Custance, which doth my heart good. To hear her name spoken doth every comfort my blood. Sit down to your work, Tibbet, like a good girl. Nurse, meddle with your spindle and your whirl. No haste but good marjorie mumblecrust for whip and whir the old proverb doth say never made good fur well ye will sit down to your work anon i trust soft fire maketh sweet malt good madge, madge mumblecrust sweet malt maketh jolly good ale for the nonce which will slide down the lane without any bones old brown crust Old brown bread crusts must have such good mumbling, but good ale down your throat hath good easy tumbling. The jolliest wench as e'er I heard. Little mouse may not rejoice that she shall dwell in my house. So, sirrah, now this gear beginneth for to frame. Thanks to God, though your work stand still, your tongue is not lame. And though your teeth be gone, both so sharp and fine, yet your tongue can rain on patterns as well as mine. Ye were not for naught named Tib Talker Pace. Doth my talk grieve you? Alack, God save your grace. I hold a groat, ye will drink anon for this gear. And I will not pray you the stripes for me to bear. I hold a penny, ye will drink without a cup. Wherein so e'er ye drink, I wot you drink all up. I cock and well sued, my, my good Tibbet Talk Pace. And e'en as well knit, my noun, Annette Alleyface. See what sort she keepeth that must be my wife. Shall not I, when I have her, lead a merry life? Welcome, my good wench, and sit here by me just. And how doth our old beldame here, Madge Mumblecrust? 
chide and find fault and threaten to complain. To make us poor girls shunt to her is small gain. I did neither chide nor complain nor threaten. I would grieve my heart to see one of them beaten. I did nothing but bid her work and hold her peace. So would I if you could your clattering cease, but the devil cannot make old trot hold her tongue. Let all these matters pass, and we three sing a song. So shall we pleasantly both the time beguile now, and eke dispatch all our works, ere we can tell how. I show them that say nay, and I shrew them that say nay, and that shall not be I. And I am well content. Sing on then, by and by. And I will not away, but listen to their song. Yet Meligree can my folks tarry very long. And Tib, uh, uh, Early Face, and Marjorie do sing here. Pipe, merry or not, triller, triller, trillery. Work, Tibbet, work or not, work, Marjorie. So, Tibbet, knit or not, spin, Marjorie. Let us see who will win the victory. This sleeve is not willing to be sewed, I trow. A small thing might make me all on, in the ground to throw. And then they sing again, pipe, merry a not, triller, triller, trillery, what tibbet, what a not, what marjorie, ye sleep, but we do not, that shall we try, your fingers be numbed, our work will not lie. If you do so again, well, I advise you say nay, in good sooth, one stop more, and I make holiday. And they sing the third time, pipe, merry or not, triller, triller, trillery. Now Tibbet, now Annot, now Marjorie, now whip it apace for the mastery. But it will not be, our mouth is so dry. Ah, each finger is numb today, Methink, I care not to let all alone choose it swim or sink. They sing the fourth time, pipe, merry or not, triller, triller, trillery. When Tibbet, when Annot, when Marjorie. I will not, I cannot, no more can I. Then give we all over, and there let it lie. And they uh, let her cast down her work. There it lies, the worst is but a curried coat. Tut, I am used there too, I care not a groat. Have we done singing since? Then will I in again. Uh, here I found you, and here I leave both twain. And as uh, 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 Aliface exits, I just want to briefly pause there on the dynamic of that song. Is it a working song to see who's going to work, do the most work kind of thing? What's the precise nature of this bet, and how is this working song functioning? It's a really interesting sequence, because it could be very funny. Mm. You know, it's like the, um, um, you know, the, 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 yeah. Um, Thoughts, uh, Sarah. You're muted at the moment. Yeah, that, I took it as a work song, and I wondered if maybe every time they sang it, it got slightly faster, mm. so that they're actually all doing their stuff. You know, they're getting faster and faster each time they sing it, just to kind of up the the comedy value. I don't know. Mm. I mean, you know, they've always did work. Sorry, Alan. It's almost in the category of lift that barge, tote that bail, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, they've they've all entered with their work, and they're you know they're going to um, there's a competitive element. Uh, I don't know if it, maybe it's just um, uh, you know who's the who's the which one was the drinker? <laughs> or they were they accusing of drinking Work. more than working? Um, you know, Tim and Marjorie are kind of accusing each other of, of yeah. excessively. Mm. Oh. So, yeah, uh, Sarah. As we've stopped, can I ask? For whip and were never made good fur. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's something like uh, haste makes waste. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I just really like that. I've never come across that proverb before. <laughs> like, I'm not entirely sure what it means. It's got. It sounds as if it could actually be a euphemism for something. Else, <laughs> it's just, it's one I want to start working into my everyday speech. Well, I, I, I was wondering, um, yeah, haste rushing about fur furrow. Um, where is it? I'm trying to find it. Um, it's uh, it's quite near the beginning of the scene. Mm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Was, eight, was it to do with talking or was it to do with working? Twelve lines down. It's to do with working. And, and like, like, yeah, more haste, less speed, like no you're spindling your world, no haste, but good. 
or whip and worthy or yeah so, so yeah, less hate uh less uh less haste more speed uh, yeah. kind of thing or you know haste makes waste it's great though it's yeah uh helen uh yeah it strikes me that this is in fact the same scene as the previous scene we've got a a, a house front which is the Custance's house mm. that ralph has been standing outside yeah they come out and there's presumably a bench of some sort or a number of places they can sit mm. outside so we're, we're we're in the same place oh yes it's the same scene this the the scene uh changes are are, are purely about entrances and exits uh, of substantial natures um so yes yeah, so uh, when it's said at the beginning when i said you know uh, uh ralph royster behind it means that they've ex they've exited from the house they've set up their their gear um to work and that there's some sort of transitiony thing going on Possibly while Ralph Royster was talking in his uh, previous little four lines or whatever, but yeah, mm. I think that's absolutely right. This they've decided to work outside today. It's a nice day, sunny. Uh, Alan, I must admit I'm getting reminds of um, Terry Pratchett, Granny we Weatherwax, Nanny Og, and and the Maiden. Mm. You know the the Weird Sisters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they, you know, let, 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 let's, you know, the, the, the nice thing is, you know, they're all, they're all, work, you know, working, useful people, uh, as opposed to the, the previous two characters we've so far met who are basically wastes of space. Um, Eric. I, I was just going to say, I like how it's, it's sort of implied that they're old, but also there's a bit where their alley face goes, oh, yeah, we poor girls and that kind of thing. And it's like basically sort of we're not really poor, like they're not girls but they're sort of maidens or maids um in that sense i don't know it's kind of mumble there. crust is a crone yes. yeah <laughs> she has no teeth left yeah. <laughs> uh yeah well it's, I, I think the uh tibbet and uh, ali face are are the younger uh, mm. i think they're the, the saturday help aren't they uh you know they're, they're, they're the servants of the household uh, other thoughts before we move on, because uh, we've 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 just sort of paused at a helpful moment in the scene, but there's lots more. To get. The Ralph is still siding behind them, <laughs> listening for useful tidbits. Okay, let's move on. So uh, Alleyface has exited. Mumblecross continues, and she's about to see Ralph Royster Doister. And I will not be long after. Tib talk a pace. What is the matter? Yon stood a man all this space, and he hath heard all that we ever spake together. Mary, the more loud he for his coming hither, and the less good he can to listen maiden's talk. I care not, and I go bid him hence for to walk. It were well done to know what he maketh hereaway. Now might I speak to them, if I wist what to say? Nay, we'll go both of us and see what he is. One that heard all your talk and singing, I wis. The more blame to you, a good thrifty husband would elsewhere have some better manners in hand. I did it for no harm, but for good love I bear to your dame, Mistress Custance, I did your talk here, and uh, Mistress no Nurse, I will kiss you for acquaintance. Oh, come anon, sir. Faith, I would our dame custom saw this here. I must wipe first all clean, yea, I must. <laughs> I hate it, doting fool, but it must be cussed. God yield you, sir. Chat not so much, you chot not when. Ne'er since was born when of such a gay gentleman. I will kiss you too, maiden, for the good will I bear ye. <laughs> no, forsooth, by your leave, you shall not kiss me. Yes, be not afeard. I do not disdain you a wit. Why should I fear you? I have not so little wit. You are but a man I know very well. Why, then? Forsooth I will not. I use not to kiss men. I would fain kiss you too, good maiden, if I might. What should that need? But to honour you by this light, I used to kiss all them that I love. To God I vow. Yea, sir, I pray you, when did you last kiss your cow? You might be proud to kiss me, if you were wise. 
What promotion were there in? Nurse is not so nice. Well, I have not been taught to kissing and licking. Yet I thank you, Mistress Nurse, you made no sticking. I will not stick for a kiss with such a man as you. They that lust, I will again to my sewing now. Enter Alleyface. <laughs> tidings ho, tidings. Dame Constance greeteth you well. Um, me? You, sir? No, sir. I do not. Uh, no such tale tell. But, and she knew me here. Uh, Tippet talk of it. Talk of pace. Um, your mistress Constance and mine must speak with your grace. With me? You must come in to her out of all doubts. Oh, and my work not half done. A mischief on all louts. And they all exit apart from Mumblecrust. Ah, good sweet nurse. Ah, good sweet gentleman. Ooh. Nay, I cannot tell, sir. What thing would you? How does sweet Custance, my heart of gold, tell me how? Oh, she doth very well, sir, and commends me to you. To me? Yes, to you, sir. To me? Nurse, tell me plain. Yea. That work maketh me alive again. She commanded me to one last day who where it was. That was e'en to me, and none other, by the mass. I cannot tell you surely, but one it was. It was I, and none other. This cometh to good pass. I promise thee, nurse, I favour her. In so, sir. Bid her sue to me for marriage. In so, sir. And surely, for thy sake, she shall speed. In so, sir. I shall be contented to take her. In so, sir. But at thy request, and for thy sake. Ah, oh, in so, sir. And come, hearken thine ear what to say. Oh, in so, sir. Here, let him tell her a long tale in her ear. Um, <laughs> so many potential games that could be played by Mumblecrust there. Don't we just love Mumblecrust? <laughs> you didn't say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but by God, the games again there, the, the, the language game is just simply what to do with Ian Sosa. It's great. I, it's a great part for someone who doesn't want to learn lines. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as good as the character No. I can't remember which play it is, but there's a character who's literally, their name is No, and that's their only line. And they, <laughs> they, they only respond to questions. Um, I, it's, it's as close to audience participation as it gets. Um, but uh, yeah, here m uh, isn't Mumblecrust fab. Um, uh, Alan, I could see Mumblecrust being played by Molly Sugden. I, 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 uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, can see, I can see lots of potential here for many people. Uh, Eric, yes, or Don French. <laughs> um, I, I was well. I was going to say that um, the whole exchange between the Royster and um, Talk talk a pace. That reminded me a bit of like the peddler's prophecy, where the maid is like, "No, you're not going to seduce me, and I don't really want to like engage in any conversation or other things with you. <laughs> so leave me alone." Well, yeah, and it's interesting, you know, when uh, Ali Face comes in and um, uh, uh, and goes, "Oh, we're needed indoors." You're just sort of wondering, is did she sort of overhear what was going on outside and this is a game that they're all playing on, you know, leave him with mumble crust, she'll, she'll have fun. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, they all seem to be in on it to a degree. But, yes, also, she just doesn't want to be kissed by him at all. No, go away. You found your level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tim is also it, it's kind of a slang for isn't isn't it sometimes slang for whore or wench or it's a we have got other tibs as sort of general servant figures yeah oh okay um, but more of a servant rather than a than a sex worker I, 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 there, there may be an additional usage i've not come across as of yet um but you know we've still got a few few you know 100 years or so to go um <laughs> but it's a respectable house Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, they're having fun. They're not no yeah. actual hanky pankies going on. Yeah, you know, with with uh, an aged female retainer. Lead house. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Widow and all female servants. Mm. Yeah. In the yeah, in the character list there's one male servant, I think. But but yeah. Mm. So um uh, let's uh, go on because we've got uh, more of a more characters, more more overlap, more things going on um, in in the next. Uh, it's called a scene, but it's basically just a continuation. When people exit from the house onto the stage where everybody is. So we have the appearance of Merry Greek. I don't know whether Royster and Mumblecrust have sort of exited or not, or whether they're uh, still just on stage somewhere else, or whether this is a separate scene, or how this flows one thing into another. But we have the appearance of Merry, Greek, and Doughty. Come on, sirs, a pace, and quit yourselves like men. Your pain shall be rewarded. Oh, no, not when. Do your master worship as ye have done in time past. Speak to them. Mine office he shall have a cast. Harpax, look that thou do well too, and thy fellow. I warrant, if he will mine example follow. Curtsy, your sons, duck you and crouch at every word. Yeah, whether our master speak earnest or bored. For this lieth upon his preferment indeed. Oft is he a wooer, but never to thee speed. But with whom is he now so sadly rounding yond? With Nob's nice bitter misery fond. Uh, God be at your wedding, be ye sped already? I did not suppose that your love was so greedy. I perceive now ye have chose of devotion. <laughs> and joy have ye, lady, of your promotion. Oh, fool, thou art deceived, this is not she. Well, mock much of her, and keep her well, I advise ye. I will take no charge of such a fair peacekeeping. What aileth this fellow? He driveth me to weeping. What? Weep on the wedding day? Be merry, woman. Though I say it, ye have chose a good gentleman. Cocks nows, what meanest thou, man? Tut a whistle. Ah, oh, sir, be good to her. She is but a gristle. Ah, sweet lamb and coney. That thou art deceived. Weep no more, lady. Ye shall be well received. Up with some merry noise, sir, to bring home the bride. Cook's arms, knaves, are thou mad? I tell thee, thou art wide. Then ye intend by night to have her home brought. I tell thee, no. Now then. Tis neither meant nor taught. What shall we then do with her? Oh, foolish harebrain, this is not she. No, is not. Why then, unsaid again, and what young girl is this with your marship so bold? A girl? Yea, I dare say, scarce yet threescore year old. This same is the fair widow's nurse of whom you wot. Ah, is she but a nurse of a house? Hence home, old trot, hence at once. No, no. Uh, what, and please your marship, a nurse talk so homely with one of your worship? I will have it so. It is my pleasure and will. Oh, then I am content. Nurse, come again. Tarry still. What? She will help forward this my suit for her part. Then it's to mine own pigsney, and blessing on my heart. This is our best friend, men. Then teach her what to say. I am taught already. Then go. Make no delay. Let hark one word in thine ear. Oh, back, sirs, from his tail. Back, villains, will ye be privy of my counsel? Back, sirs. So, I told you afore ye would be shent. She shall have the first day of a whole peck of argent. A peck? Nomine patris, have ye so much to spare? Yeah, and a cart lord there too, or else were it bare, besides other movables, household stuff and lend. Have ye lands too? And hundred marks? Yea, a thousand. And have ye cattle too? And sheep too? Yea, a few. He is ashamed the number of them to show. 
e'en round about him as many thousand sheep goes, as he and thou and I too have fingers and toes. And how many years old be you? Forty at least. Yea, and thrice forty to them. Nay, thou dost jest, I am not so old, thou misre misreconest my years. I know that, but my mind was on bullocks and steers. And what shall I show her your mastership's name is? Nay, she shall make suit, ere she know that I wis. Yet let me somewhat know. This is he, understand, that killed the blue spider in Blanche Powder land. Yea, Jesus, Jesus, Williams and Lord, did he so law? Yea, and the last elephant that ever he saw as the beast passed by, he start out of a busk and e'en with pure strength of arms plucked out his great tusk. Jesus, nomine patris, what a thing was that? Yeah, but Merrick, one thing thou hast forgot. <laughs> what? Of that elephant. Oh, him that fled away. Yeah. Yea, he knew that his match was in place that day. Oh, he bet the king of crickets on Christmas day that he crept in a hole and not a word to say. A sore man by Zembleton. Why, he wrung a club once in a fray out of the hand of Beelzebub. And how when Menfesian? Oh, your costrelling bore the land in a field so before the gosling. Nay, this is too long a matter to be told now to be told. Never ask his name, nurse, I warrant thee. Be bold. He conquered in one day from Rome to Naples, and won towns, nurse, as fast as thou canst make apples. Oh, Lord, my heart quaketh for fear he is so sore. Thou makest her too much afeard, Mary Greg, no more. This tale would fear my sweetheart Custance right evil. Nay, let her take him, nurse, and fear not the devil. But thus is our song dashed. Sirs, ye may go home again. No, shall they not. I charge you all here to remain. The villain's slaves a whole day ere they can be found. Oh, couch on your merry bones, horsons, down to the ground. Was it meet he should tarry so long in one place without harmony of music or some solace? Whoso hath such bees as your master in his head had need to have his spirits with music be fed uh, by your mastership's license. What is that? A moat? Uh, no, it was a fowl's feather had light upon your coat. I was nine or feathers since I came from my bed? Uh, no, sir, it was a hair that was full from your head. My men come when he pleased them. By your leave. What is that? Your gown was foul spotted with the foot of a gnat. Their master to fend they are nothing afeard. What now? Oh, a lousy hair from your mastership's beard. And sir, for nurse's sake, pardon this one offence. You shall not after this show like the like negligence. I pardon you these ones and Come, see ne'er the worse. How like you the goodness of this gentleman, nurse? Oh, God save his mastership that can so his men forgive. And I will hear them sing ere I go, by his leave. Mary, and thou shalt, wench, come, we two will dance. Nay, I will by mine own self foot the song perchance. Guide, sirs. Lastly, oh, pipe up a merry note, let me hear it played. I will foot it for a groat. And I'll ask Alan to read the song, please. Whoso to marry a minion wife has had good chance and hap, must love her and cherish her all his life and dandle her in his lap. If she will fare well, if she will go gay, a good husband ever still, whatever she lusts to do or say, must let her have her own will. About what affairs soever he go, he must show her all his mind. None of his counsels she may get to throw, else he is a man unkind. Now, nurse, 
take this same letter to thy mistress, and as my trust is in thee, ply my business. It shall be done. Who made it? I wrote it, each wit. Then needs it no mending? No, no. Oh, no, I know your wit. I warrant it well. It shall be delivered, but if he speed, shall I be considered? Hoo -hoo. Dost thou doubt of that? What shall I have? An hundred times more than thou canst devise to crave. Shall I have some new gear, for my old is all spent? The worst kitchen wench shall go in ladies' raiment. Yea. And the worst drudge in the house shall go better than your mistress doth now. Then I trudge with your letter. Now may I repose me, Custance is my own. Let us sing and play homeward, that it may be known. But are you sure that your letter is well enough? I wrote it myself. <laughs> then sing we to dinner. And here they sing and go out singing. Um, that sequence only really works once you see, you've worked out all the physical business. It is so full of physical business. Um, the whole mumble crust being told to leave, coming back again, leaving, coming back again, the servants semi following and coming back again. It's all about that back and forth. And it's even funnier, uh, presumably, because mumble crust probably doesn't move very quickly. So it's like, just got to the door. You want me to come back again? Okay, and back again, and, and just this constant back and forth. And also, we've got a whole sequence where Merry Greek is hitting Royster and pretending he's just getting, oh, it's just a bit of fluff. Oh, Whack. that's what was going what on was there. That? I was like, what is going on? What is going on? I was like reading it and thinking, I have no idea what is going on here. Yeah, so, yeah. There's, and it, so a lot of that makes no sense without seeing what's going on, because, of course, nothing's really going on, um, apart from sort of extended you know, mock, oh, you're marrying Mumblecrust, lucky, lucky, lucky you, um, business. So um, it's a very densely complicated bit of theatrical business. It's very theatrical. Mm -hmm. uh, who wants to leap in first? Uh, Valentina, are you waving or just... Stretching? Yeah, no, I mean, like, I was, I was kind of like, I mean, am I getting it right? Like, because presumably, like, at the beginning of the scene, for the whole interlude, Royster is with Mumblecrust. Because mm. that's where why Mary Greek goes like, oh, you find your lady, okay, you yeah. good, yeah, and like, okay, and then like, is it, is it just my like, um, like at a certain point, I kind of thought he actually quite liked his interlude with Mumblecross, because there was a moment where I was like, yeah, does it like? I mean, I know that he needs to use her anyway for like to to send the letter, but I was kind of like, don't send her away, like she. Like the, there was something weird going on. It would be fun to see once you know, like if you workshop it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, uh, the, the, I mean you're absolutely right. The, the, he's on stage c c conversing with Mumblecrust while they're turning up with their instruments, you know, to do their sort of part of the plan that was set up earlier. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, yeah, what you said about there's a lot of physical business here. Um, I think might be also a, a, a useful observation about why are Harpax and Dobbinette even here? They have so little to do. They yeah. might be part of that physical comedy. They're singing, mm -hmm. excuse, yeah, it's like any excuse for a song. So there must be parts in the, in the multi-part singing because they don't really have anything to do in this scene. Yeah, they, they are the singers. They're there. Um, there are a few mo t times when it seems explicitly like they go, Okay, we're off as well. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering how long a train of, of people trying to exit there are in this scene. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's lots of witnesses who are just sort of doing stuff. But yeah, they don't say almost anything at all. Uh, Helen? I, Royster seems to have very little control over his servants because he, the reason he says he won't let them go is that they take about a day to round up again. <laughs> <laughs> they are cats. He, he's employed cats. Um, also, I think it's the sense of his servants are not really his servants. They've sort of been co-opted by Merry Greek as well, it seems. Or I don't know if that's, that's just, you know, Merry Greek sort of co-opted the household somewhat. There's, you know, the, the, the sense that he, his orders are matter more than Ralph's. 
Uh, Eric. Uh, the you kind of get the impression that it's that thing like that we saw last week with the feigned entrances and stuff and exits and like that you kind of you know like maybe pulling them by the collar or something like oh don't go or you know go don't go go don't go that kind of push me pull you <laughs> like who's in control here and sort of that that bit about Mary Greek trying to undermine Royster's intelligence or like spelling or just like the way he writes like oh i wrote it myself the letter and it's like hey yeah oh good you wrote <laughs> yeah. it yourself <laughs> yes i'm sure it will be wonderful <laughs> pretty much <laughs> yeah but so much singing <laughs> yeah but to be fair there is that is sort of plot in based there, there is an element to do with this is to create wooing atmosphere um for his love so they're not completely gratuitous the, the songs are all linked to action so we've got a working song we've got a wooing song um and so yeah that's 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 uh, structured i like structure alan i'm just wondering actually whether you could par whether you could uh, cast uh, merry greek as jeeves and um royster is worcester it was interesting we were discussing what class you know, I mean, obviously that's a modern class thing that is is not necessarily properly applicable, but um, it, it is an interesting thing what their social statuses are uh, and how that functions. Uh, Helen? I think the, the peak of the play we've probably just passed, which is Mumble Crust Dance. <laughs> because she dances to that last song. It's a solo. Mm. Um, I, it's a, it, it would be good. It's a good part. I do like Mumblecrust um, so much. Uh, Francis, then Lynn. Yeah, I was just going to say Roy, uh, Royster Royster just comes across as nice, but dim. Mm. Mm. He's not getting it, is he? Uh, no. Lynn. Yeah, in terms of the, the master-servant relationship, the, there might be sort of a class equivalency with... Um, Worcester and Jeeves, but but temperamentally, Mary Greek is not. He's not that super buttoned up. No. Uh, Jeeves, you know, he's kind of more the clown. He's all over the place. Mm. He's he, much closer he, to a vice figure, isn't he? Yeah. Or yeah, or a, um, he's been influenced by the uh, the, the commedia. He's more of a. He's a scapin. He's a. He's a scapino. Uh, or uh, Arlecchino character. More yeah. than that, that super hyper proper uh, servant type. Yeah, uh, Valentina. Sorry, I was just ob objecting to the nice to Royster because I think like some of the things he says can be interpreted as being quite like objectionable, objectionable, um, depending by the like like what the performance is going to end up being like. Mm. But uh, yeah. Like all the comments on Tib did really don't run well. Like don't don't go down well. Yeah. No, no. there's a lot of privilege there, isn't there? Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Francis. Yeah, I I think you could also play the relationship between Mary Greek and uh, Royster Doyster a bit like um, Jack and Algernon in um, Importance of Being Earnest, where they are social equals, but one's mm. a little more. Um, what's the word? Um, less uptight than the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I think there's there, there's there's that. I don't think Mumblecrust is necessarily uh, not Mumblecrust. Uh, Mumblecrust on the way. Merry Greek is uh, necessarily a much lower status. He's just much lower income. Yeah. Um, Sarah. Yeah, I was just uh, not not in terms of his character because yeah, he's in terms of his character, he is more of a vice type figure but in terms of his social status uh i was thinking of mr skimpole from um uh dickens bleak house so he's mm. like the he's the leech yeah. he's the he's a parasite yeah he's the parasite so he's like he's the same status he's had the same kind of he's comes from the same background but he just yeah he has no money and he's just he's just leeching off whoever is around and clearly um oyster oyster does have Money because he has thousands of sheep. Mm. He's Allegedly. Well, he Allegedly. Has some, he has <laughs> some sheep. <Yes. laughs> Mary Greek says there are thousands of them. Royster just says some. Yes. yes. 
I, I, I suspect the counting between the two of them is one too many lots. Yes, uh, mm. Eric. I was just going to say that the dynamic is sort of like the you know the whole Prince Regent uh, Blackadder as Butler thing, but not quite the same because like Blackadder is trying to earn his money, uh, like uh, earn a way out of there, mm. whereas this is more like sort of make taking the make out of him basically. Yeah, I mean, there's there's something very aggressive about uh, Merry Greek and, and to a degree about uh, Royster. And again, mm. going back to Jack Juggler, which the parallels keep flying in my face um, of this is, uh, you know, in Jack Juggler, you've got a two person thing with a mark and, 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 a, and an aggressor. One person uh, who's basically decided to ruin somebody else's day. And it's the same dynamic uh, in that, uh, albeit slightly less of an existential crisis in Jack Juggler. Um, the, the, the chap comes in and just says, I'm you. Who, I'm, I'm, I'm Jack, who are you? I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm servant in this household. Who, who are you? What are you doing in this house? And the moment he tries to affirm who his actual identity is, the other chap just beats him against a wall until he agrees that he isn't who he is. It's, um, it's hilarious and also really disturbing. Yeah, it sounds um, <laughs> it's, um, And this, this poor, uh, he's a bit of a wastrel, um, but he, you know, uh, so in that sense, it's a very similar dynamic, just in a different context and a, uh, a different status. There's definitely servants as opposed to here who are not. Um, so full cast audio adaptation is available on the podcast, as well as a, a spoiler session where we go through the text in some detail. Well, in fact, I do ridiculous amounts of detail. It's hours, hours of stuff on a very short play. Anyway, uh, so we're going to go on to uh, Act 1, Scene 5, as, it, as it's called. We have just had an exit of everybody, so we could actually call this a different scene, <laughs> which is unfortunate because it closes the act. So, um, so um, we have the uh, appearance of Christian uh, Custance, don't think we've actually met before, and uh, everybody's favourite, Marjorie Mumblecrust. Who took me this letter, Marjorie Mumblecrust? A lusty gay bachelor took it me of trust. And if he seek to him, he will love your doing. Yea, but where her learned he that manner of wooing? If to sue to him you will any pains take, he will have you to his wife, he saith, for my sake. Some wise gentleman be like, I am bespoken. And I thought verily this had been some token from my dear spouse, Gawain Goodluck, whom when he pleased, God luckily sent him to both our hearts' ease. A jolly man it is, I wot well by report, and would have you to him for marriage resort. Best open the writing and see what it doth speak. At this time, nurse, I will neither read nor break. He promised to give you a whole peck of gold. Perchance twill lack a pint when it shall all be told. I would take a gay rich husband if I were you. In sooth, Madge, in so would I if I were thou. But no more of this fond talk. Now, let us go in and see thou no more move me, move me folly to begin nor bring me no more letters for no man's pleasure, but thou know from whom. I won't. Ye shall be sure. Uh, okay, a little delayed gratification there. They're not opening the letter yet. Maybe maybe we will get that. Maybe we will. Um, but uh, we've met Custance. Um, she's not in the mood. She's She's got a bow. We're not going to linger here. We're going to move straight into Act 2, Scene 1. Uh, Dobinet Doughty. Uh, uh, who I don't think we've met before. I don't think yes, we did. Did we? Was it? oh, he was he was in the last scene, wasn't he? Yes. Did he say anything? Yes. Oh, <laughs> so memorable, so memorable. Yeah. Let's find I out mean, more because he's going to say a lot now. Yes. <laughs> Where's the house I go to, before or behind? I know not where, nor when, nor how I shall it find. If I had ten men's bodies and legs and strength. This trotting that I have must lead lame me at length. And now that my master is new set on wooing, I trust the wish in none of us find lack of doing. Two pair of shoes a day will now be too little to serve me. I must trot to and fro so mickle. Go bear me this token, carry me this letter. 
know, this is the best way. Now that way is better. Up before days, sir, I charge you an hour or twain. Trudge, do me this message and bring word quick again. One miss but a minute then, his arms and wounds. I would not have slacked for ten thousand pounds. Nay, I beseech thee of my most trusty page, go not about now to hinder my marriage. So fervent hot wooing, and so far from wiving, a trowel, never was any creature living. <clears throat> With every woman his he and some likes pang, then up to our loot at midnight, twangled them, twang! Then twang with our sonnets, and twang with our dumps, and hey ho from our hearts as heavy as lead lumps. Then to our recruiter with toodle pip pop, and a howlet out of an Irish boot, bush or hoop. And on to our gittin, thrumple dum, thrumple dum, thrum, thrumple dum, thrumple dum, thrumple dum, thrumple dum, thrum. Songs and ballads also here's a maker, and that he can do finely as a Jack Raker. Yea, and extempore will his ditties compose. Foolish Masaris never made the like, I suppose. Yet must we sing them as good stuff I undertake, as for such a penman well fitting to make. Ah, for these long nights. Hey ho, when will it be day? I fear, ere I come, she will be wooed away. Then when answer is made, that it may not be. Oh, death, why comest thou not? By and by, saith he. But then from his heart to put away sorrow, he is as far in with some new love next morrow. In the mean season we trudge and we trot, from day spring to midnight, I sit not nor rest not, and now I am sent to Dame Christian Custance, but I fear it will end with a mock for pastance. I bring her a ring with a token in clout. I all guess this same is her house out of doubt. I know it now perfect, I am in my right way. And lo, beyond the old nurse that was with us last day. So we've got an indication of time has passed. Uh, it was, uh, they met Mumblecrust the other day and aren't we glad it's Mumblecrust time again, <laughs> coming up. Yeah, um, yeah some um, yeah, twangledum twang, uh, thrumpledum thrumpledum thrum. Um, some uh, some lovely uh, lovely things. He's he's not a happy servant, is he? Um, no. <laughs> and he's mostly lost for the first, um, you know, twenty thirty lines, and then oh no, I found it. You know, because it's obviously a massive stage. Um, so yeah, uh, thoughts on Doughty's speech there, uh, Helen. The um, early modern equivalent of uh, making a compilation CD for your girlfriend is obviously to have your own um, uh, uh, suitor, you have your own consort <laughs> going thrum, thrum, thrum. <laughs> Why bother with a mixtape when you can get real musicians? Mm. I was going to say he's got his, uh, a live mixtape. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. trouble is, he seems to have written the songs. <laughs> yeah, I want. I want to know what 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 Ra Ralph Royster Deutsch's songs sound like. Uh, I'm. I'm I, at the moment. I'm just hearing my lovely horse as uh, <laughs> as a template. Um... <laughs> the wheels on the bus. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, maybe those. That's literally the words. That wasn't actually him miming, doing the, the the sounds. But maybe the lyrics are thrumple dum, thrumple dum, thrum. <laughs> and God, here, you could see Tony Robinson having fun with that one, couldn't you? Yes, and here's a lovely ballad we call Twangled and Twang. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts before we go into some mumble crust? Okay, uh, so Mumblecrust uh, has, uh, approaches Doughty, or vice versa. I was never so shook up a before or for since I was born that our mistress could not have chid, I would have sworn. And I pray God I die if I meant any harm, but for my lifetime this shall be to me a charm. God you save and see, nurse. And how is it with you? Marry, a good deal the worse it is for such as thou. For me? Why so? 
Why would thou not thou one of them say that sang and played here with the gentleman last day? Yes, and he would know if you have for him spoken. I praise you to deliver this ring and token. Now, by the token that God token, brother, I will deliver no token, one nor other. I have been so shent for your master's pleasure that I will not be again for all his treasure. He will thank you, woman. I will none of his thank. And exit Mumblecrust. I ween I'm a prophet. This gear will prove blank. Or should I home again without answer go? It were better to go to Rome on my head than so. I will tarry here this month, but some of the house shall take it of me. Then I care not a louse. But yonder cometh forth a wench or a lad. If he have not one of Lombard's touch, my luck is bad. And here we have the entrance uh, of Troopany, Doughty, Tib, uh, uh, Alleyface, uh, uh, all of them at once or one at a time. I am clean lost for lack of merry company. We, we, we agree not half well within, our wenches and I. They will, com they will command like mistresses. They will forbid if they be not served. Troopany must be cheered. Let them be as merry now as ye can desire. With turning of a hand, our mirth lieth in the mire. I cannot skill of such changeable metal. There is nothing with them but in dock our nettle. Whether it's better that I speak to him first, or he first to me, it's good to cast the worst. If I begin first, he will smell all my purpose. Otherwise, I shall not need anything to disclose. What boy have we yonder? I will see what he is. He cometh to me. It is hereabout, Lewis. Wouldst thou aught, friend, that thou lookest so about? Yea, but whether ye can help me or no, I doubt. I seek to one Mistress Custon's house here dwelling. It is my mistress ye seek to, by your telling. Is there any of that name here but she? Not one in all the whole town that I know, Pardee. A widow she is, I trow. And what, and she be? But insured to an husband? Yea, so think we. And I dwell with a husband that trusteth to be. In faith, then must thou needs be welcome to me. Let us, for acquaintance, shake hands together, and whate'er thou be, heartily welcome hither. Well, true penny, never but flinging. And frisking. Well, Tibbet, and are not, still swinging and whisking. But ye royal abroad. In the street everywhere. Where are ye twain? In chambers when ye meet when ye meet me there? But come hither, fools. I have one now by the hand, servant to him that must be our mistress' husband. Bid him welcome. To me he truly is welcome. Forsooth, and as I may say, heartily welcome. I thank you, mistress maids. I hope we shall better know. And will our new master come? Shortly, I trow. I would it were tomorrow, for till he resort, our mistress, being a widow, hath small comfort. And I heard our nurse speak of an husband today, ready for our mistress, a rich man and gay, and we shall go and we shall go in our French hoods every day, and our silk cassets, I warrant you, fresh and gay, and our trick furtigues and billaments of gold, brave in our suits of change, seven double fold. Then shall ye see, Tibbet, sirs, tread the moss so trim. Nay, why say I tread? You shall see her glide and swim, not lumberty clumperty like an old Spanish, like our spaniel rig. Marry then, prick me dainty, come, toast me a fig. Who shall then know our Tib talker pace, trow ye? Why not Annot Alleyface as fine as she? And what, had Tom Truepenny a father or none? Then our pretty newcome man will look to be one. We four, I trust, shall be a merry knot, a jolly merry knot. Shall we sing a fit to welcome our friend or not? Perchance he cannot sing. I am at all the says. 
Bycock, and better welcome to us always. And I'll ask Francis to sing the merry song. <clears throat> a thing very fit for them that have wit and, uh, and our fellows knit, servants in one house to be, as fast for to sit and not off, not off to flit, nor vary a wit, but lovingly to agree, no man complaining, no other disdaining for loss or for gaining, but fellows or friends to be, no grudge remaining, no work refraining, nor help restraining, but lovingly to agree, no man for despite, but word or by right, his fellow to twight, but further in honesty, no goods turn entwight, nor old souls recite, but let all go quiet and lovingly to agree. After drudgery, when they be weary, then to be merry, to laugh and sing they be free, with chip and cherry, hey derry derry, hey derry derry, trill on the berry, and lovingly to agree. Will you now in with us to our mistress go? I have first for my master an errand or two, but I have here from him a token and a ring. They shall have most thank of her that first doth it bring. Mary, that will I. See, and Tibbet snatch not now. And why may I, may not I, sir, get thanks as y well as you? And she exits. Yet get ye not all, we, we will go both, we, we, yeah, we, <laughs> yet get ye not all, we will go with you both and have part of your thanks, be ye never so loath. And follows swiftly after. So my hands are rid of it, I care for no more. I may now return home, so durst I not before. And exit Doughty. Um, so, um, broadly speaking, the confusion, of course, of the household is they're thinking he's from the proper affianced. Um, so they're all going, oh, isn't it great? She's going to get married again. Because uh, it's always, it's been so dull. And I'm wondering here when they're talking about we're going to get lovely new clothes. It's not just for the wedding, but maybe it's, is she in widow, widow's weeds? You know, is everyone wearing black or whatever the convention of the time would have been? And, you know, now they'll be able to wear nice things again. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's a, a different convention from a different time. Um, but I'm, I'm just uh, wondering about that. You know, a bit of gaiety in the household. You know, we don't know what the, the, old, the old husband was like. Mm. Um, you know, what things, what things were like before. Um, but yeah, Doughty, Doughty, the question, Doughty in Doughty's mind just constantly going, how do I get rid of this ring? How do I get rid of this ring? Who's going to take the ring? Because Mumble Cross said no. <laughs> but they, they were fighting over who could take it. It was like, literally, no, I'll take it. No, I'll, I'll, I'll stand next to you when you hand it over. Yeah. <laughs> Alan. Yeah, I'm just wondering, coming back to the question of the servants of Barrel, we had a hint earlier in... Uh, one of Rafe's speeches that uh, the servants would, would get new liveries and clothing and so on. So I'm wondering whether that was actually a custom of the time among households where a rich marriage was celebrated. Yeah, possibly. Uh, Lynn? I, I kind of think that it's just that um, um, Ralph Rafe is is uh, saying, oh, I'm just, I'm so rich that even my servants will dress like gentlefolk and then um, my wife and I will dress like royalty. I mean, it's actually kind of absurd that, that serving women would go out in the street with hoods rather than hats. The, you know, a, a citizen's wife would wear a hat, a nobleman's wife would wear a, a hood. I mean, it's completely, it's, it's, it's really inappropriate. It's I. It, yeah, it's like they would be dressing way above their their place in society. I mean, it's it's kind of absurd. It's 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 funny because it's ridiculous. Well, it's it's it's. But the the driver of that is coming from um, you know Tib and 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 the the women of that household. You know, they don't know that there, there's a confusion here. They're thinking it's the respectable marriage. Mm. So maybe it's just youth thinking, oh, we'll get lovely things. Um, you know, because uh, it's not like uh, Mumblecrust is saying this, you know, the, 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 the wise woman who is wise. Um, you know, it's the younger servants who are getting, running away with this idea of lovely things. 
Uh, other thoughts, Helen? Uh, apparel was very expensive. Mm. Um, in, in in comparison, I mean, if if you remember the the in um, the famous victories, the uh, French are putting together chests in which they can steal, in which they can take the English apparel that they will take from the battlefield. Mm. Because it's a, it's a very highly lootable. Um, and, and the English side are stealing their shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were cobblers. They were cobblers. Um, True. Oh, and, but, and what, but, but what I mean is that, uh, that getting a complete new suit of cl good clothes new especially if they were new clothes and not second hand in order in s celebration of a marriage would be something that would be valuable for years to come mm. uh, lynn yeah so yes yes that's my understanding of clothing in the period as well and we had what was the uh, the the play we did recently where um the four ladies where the woman had to pawn her gown for rent i mean so the the relative value is very different um, now. Like, like what dress could be fancy enough that it's a month's worth of rent? That's not unusual. Like you would pawn clothes well into the 18th century. But, you know, gentlemen would pawn their clothes for, uh, for money. So yeah, there's a lot of time and effort and materials in clothing. Clothing was also a very legible marker of class. That's why they had to keep passing waves and waves of sumptuary laws because there was this anxiety about people crossing or seeming to cross class boundaries by dressing above their station. So yeah, clothing was clothing was more costly and a bigger invest, investment and had more sort of socially um, in, social significance than it does even even now. Um. Yes, uh, there was something I was going to say in response to that, but it's yes. Uh, in the plays, uh, we've looked at three lords, uh, 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 three ladies of London, and also Looking Glass for London and England both have people selling clothing. Um, uh, the the you know the question of selling your clothing or selling your cow, which 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 the, that 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 decision still haunts, uh, still haunts. No cow. Uh, no cow. No cow. No uh, cow. Alan. Yeah, you know, I, was, I was thinking actually on this pawning the clothing. I mean that continued in parts of Britain until into the 20th century. Mm. That way. Yeah, you know, certainly up until um, pre-Second pre World War. Mm. Yeah, um, was documented get... by in um, Road to Wigan Pier, for example. Mm. Mm. I mean, any time pre-synthetics. Mm. Yeah. In well, in pre-industrial revolution, a lot of the expense was uh, was actually in the labor. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay, we are approaching extra time. So it's time for general thoughts about the play so far, the characters, the... I think we should say comic potential. Shall we... Sh let's ask the question generally, uh, you know, was the prologue right? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, so I think, I think, you know, the prologue, the prologue, you know, I, I can't remember who voiced doubts at the efficacy of, of telling the audience that it's going to be a, a comedy. Um, you know, they, they, they were right. They were right. Um, so yeah, general thoughts about the play so far, where you think it might be going, the comic potential, um, of these scenes, stuff that could be done, you know, the additional physical comic business that could be unlocked in these scenes, um, you know, uh, just general general thoughts. So we'll start with Eric. Eric, what are your general thoughts about the play so far? Royster Doyster. Well, it's very cheerful. I mean, it's got a lot of songs. It's got. I, I think it's one of those things where, like, if you don't like what's going on or you don't really get what's going on, the songs do work for it. Um, but also, it's sort of that... Well, I mean, we've seen plays like this before. It's not entirely original in terms of, you know what it's doing but it's doing it well so far because like there's a lot of parts where i'm like trying not to choke on the water that i'm drinking uh, <laughs> while you know while other people are doing their own thing um so yeah that's yeah. what i think 
Excellent. Um, uh, Francis, um, uh, general thoughts about the play uh, and, and anything you'd like to see more of or less of? Um, um, let's, <clears throat> uh, well, yeah, like Eric says, it, it is a very, there's some very familiar elements in it, like a mistaken identity, you know, the passing of letters. Um, but it, uh, as Eric says, it does it very well. It's, um, it's a very enjoyable play and I'm very intrigued to see where it goes and who um, Christian Customs ends up with eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't call it at this point. Uh, yeah, we, we need a bed trick scene, really, for this play, don't we? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, what we're talking about things we've seen before. I, I don't know how many things we'll have seen before this play. Um, so, right, you know, yeah. Some of these things are, are, are posted now. This is mid-Tudor, um, you, know, uh, you know, the 1550s. Um, so yes, a lot of these elements are seen before, or seen before by the same author. I mean, you know, let's let's. There's a certain recycling of ideas, um, but you know, with a comedy, who wants an original comedy really? <laughs> <laughs> we just want one that makes you laugh. Um, so yeah, Alan, final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think as you said, uh, there are a lot of a lot of the words are there. I think basically just to build physical business round. I think it's going to be much more a visual comedy than a verbal comedy. Um, you know, the sequence that you highlighted where the uh, um, Mary, Mary Greek is, is talking to Royster Doyster and uh, so not knocking allegedly fluff off his uh, coat or whatever. I think the words are not funny necessarily in their own right, but they provide a scaffold on which you can build the physical comedy. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure, because um, there's an awful lot of wordplay and interplay between, mm. uh, you know, Merry Greek and, and, and Royster Doyster throughout. I mean, that, that opening sparring match between the two of them is all a wit, and, and it's all about what's, what's being said and what's being done. I mean, it's how you act it. And, you know, it's full of physical games, but it's all being driven by the words. It doesn't feel like a scaffold. I mean, it just means that it's a complicated sequence that is as much about physical comedy as it is about the words. Um, as opposed to, say, some of the comics like, um, you know, that we have in the clown parts in later plays, where it's just you expect the clown to elaborate on that to make it funnier. Um, or you hope to God that they did because it wasn't very funny. Um, you know, whereas whereas this is very much a situation uh, and and words and and physical. You know, it's almost sitcom, not quite sitcom. Um, Valentina, final thoughts. Yeah, no, I was actually quite surprised that a lot of the jokes that are in there still work. Mm. Um, but um, I would like to say that yes, the prologue did 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 did. did get it right but I don't think the play is quite as clean as it kind of wanted it because they kind of went they kind of went like oh it's not rude it's not scurrilous at all but actually <laughs> yes. there's quite a lot of double and thunder in it so <laughs> well going back to Jack Juggler again uh, the interesting thing with that is the prologue does come out very lengthily and explains in, for a very long time why this play is not about something and it does that at great length and says it's all fine, there's no moral in it at all. And then there's an epilogue that seems to have been written by somebody else that just goes, no, no, it's, yeah, there was a serious moral. Yes, definitely was. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, no, that was just too silly and, uh, uh, kind of thing. Uh, and it just felt like desperate, desperate rearguard action <laughs> by the, uh, the headmaster to say, no, nope, no, nope, was, 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 wasn't silly at all. Wasn't silly. Um, yeah. Uh, are you complaining about it being ruder, though? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lynn, final thoughts? Um, yeah, I was uh, just what everyone else has said that the, uh, the, the prologue did make me a little apprehensive. Like, you know, you're already sort of telling us how to, how to respond and rather than letting the text deliver the goods on its own. But, I, but the comedy holds up really quite well. 
Mm. So oh. yeah, so far it's yeah, it's it, this could be really funny. Mm. It could also be terrible. Re- you know, it really does need a company that knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, I mean, you made that observation bef- before that the the even if we didn't have any kind of of provenance it, from the text, it would be clear that this is a bunch of people who are who know each other, who sort of bounce off of each other. The because timing is really quite important. Uh, mm. and, timing but, is really important in, in making this work. Well, yeah, it's it's going back to Res Publica as well, which is another text which is probably by Udall. Is you know, whereas in that, the dialogue actually overlapped and there was interruptions, and you know. Um, and you know that's maybe a year later, and it's like you know the if this is a tight group of performers who know you can trust them with material, and you know who've done this to then go on and do something where you're not only doing comic business and dialogue and complicated stuff, you're actually interrupting each other and breaking in and uh, and you're chopping and changing it even more um, if that continuity is accurate, um, which it may not be. Um, Helen, final thoughts. Well, two two smallish things. One is that it's one of the very few plays where it seems it's practically impossible to overact. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean there's 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 so much that's 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 good. And the the more I mean I'm thinking obviously mainly of, of um mumble crust, but I mean It'd be very difficult to overdo mumble crust. Um, And the the second thing is that wearing a historian's hat, I'm quite interested in the depiction of the relationships of the servants' hall, as we would, I mean, obviously there wasn't a servants' hall, but it's a useful term, um, especially where there's the idea of two households combining on a marriage, where there could be all sorts of problems between servants. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of other plays where the servants have played such an important, have been their their aims and their desires and their their interactions have been quite so well done. Mm. Yes, and it doesn't look. Yeah, it doesn't look also like it's sort of punching down on these 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 characters no. in the way that we we have sometimes mm. had. You know, they they are broadly drawn, but they they are affectionately drawn, and they they, they mm. work really well. Um, and um, I, 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 I've, I'm sorry, Mumblecrust is just a license to print money. Um, <laughs> for you know, when they're in com- conference upstage or to one side of the stage when other people are coming in, if she doesn't grab him and uh, give him a massive snog at that point, at some point to just completely upstage everybody else, I'd, I, I'd be very disappointed in a production that doesn't do that. You know, I think she, she her disappointment when she finds out she's not getting married to him, um, you know, <laughs> or, and all the jokes that are being played slightly at her expense, which actually could be a moment when you really turn very against Mary Greek because there's something really quite unpleasant about that moment actually and I think that sh- that should be embraced that we should we should play all the angles of here that there are bits that are pure comedy but there's also bits where it's, it gets quite nasty because mm-hmm. that's what practical jokes are they're just nasty uh, really uh, Alan just wondering whether Mumble Cross could actually be played as a sort of prototype pantomime dame I don't know I, I maybe um I, 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 I didn't see it that way myself, actually. I, I, I mean, Helen was talking about things being, you can't overplay this, but I, I actually see Mumblecrust as being the subtlest potentially character in, in, the whole, in, in the whole group, actually. There's something quite really nicely innocent about her. Mm-hmm. You know, just constantly walking on and off stage <laughs> very slowly. And dancing. And dancing. And there should that be dance. Joy. That like, dance will have will be one. I mean, however yeah. badly she does it, it's going to be glorious. It, yeah. it, no, it's got to be a moment of joy, hasn't it? From yeah. her, yes. there's got to be something. Some there's got to be a backstory uh, into that dance that you uh, you put in. Isn't there a bit in the royal family, the uh, the, the, the 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 television family, rather than the uh, the, the the royal royal family, um, uh, where oh. the um, with Nana. Yeah, where it's yeah. Just, sing a song or something, she, or some. There's a moment when yeah. it, it's it's something really sweet in the middle of 
other stuff happening. Mm. Um, and it's something like that. Um, anyway, Sarah, I think you're in for the final, final thought. Um, I've done so many of these plays where I, I love them to begin with. And then by the end, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm wary of, of going overboard but I have to say so far at least I am absolutely loving this the comedy is so deft um I love the fact that the servants and the women are having um most of the most of the airtime um it's funny I, I remember last week when we did Dr Doddy Paul saying at the end that like there are other plays there are other plays that would be better to do. And I feel that this could potentially be one of them because it's like so many of these plays, it's the heroes and they get the women and, you know, but the, and they're, they're meant to be heroic, but they are actually fairly awful, fairly awful, overprivileged, entitled idiots. And, and here, um, the, the, you've got your two sort of high status male characters who are, just overprivileged, awful idiots. And they're meant to be, and it's funny. Um, and then you've got all these, um, these, these great female characters, these, these great servant characters who are just like pinging off the page. Um, so much good physical comedy potential, but I agree with you, so much in the written word as well. So much wordplay back and forth, zinging off each other. Um, I think this is the sort of play that would actually so far, based on what I've seen so far, I may have changed my mind by the end of Thursday, but um, so far I would say this is the sort of play that would translate really well to a modern audience because it is, it's looking, it's, it's satirizing privilege. Um, it's not turning the status quo on its head exactly, but it's certainly pushing that env envelope a little bit, I think. It's, it's uh, you know, um, you know, looking at uh, these sort of stock characters in a different kind of way. Um, I'm super impressed that he wrote this in, what did you say, 1550? Um, 52. Uh, 52, yeah. I mean, I'm super impressed that this is so early because, like, really, it's, I think, very sophisticated. Um, very funny. And I'm looking forward so much to seeing where it goes. And I hope I'm not disappointed. <laughs> Because sometimes I am. Yeah, well, I, I think sometimes the disappointment is, especially with any comedies, you have time to think when we do it over several sessions. Mm. Um, you know, the thing about comedies is, you know, if there are plot holes or, 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 or things, I mean, all comedy, broadly speaking, goes along the lines of something horrible happens to something uh, to someone and we laugh at them. Um, if, if you actually boil down most comedies, it's about something terrible happening to someone for comic effect. And it's only once, you, because it happens so quickly, you don't have time to think about, hang on, no, this situation is horrible. His life's just been ruined. Um, or their lives, or et cetera. Um, there's always an obstacle. There's always something making somebody's life worse. Mm. One of the things I say about comedy when rehearsing it is how do we make this scene worse? How do we make this situation worse? How do we turn the screw? How do we squeeze more out of this situation? And, you know, analyzing comedy to a degree opens that up to to that kind of problem because you know we we, we realized you know the the awfulness of of some of the situations that we put we put people in where when you run it at pace those things don't apply and so it'd be quite interesting when we come back to this and do it as a through run mm. um um it, i i'd be interested to see how that pace and the potential for the comedy just following on and building uh, and the flow of it, because we have also stopped at a really weird place in the text to stop. You know, if we would have stopped a few scenes earlier, that would have been, you know, or seen earlier, that would have been, you know, where there was a time break of a day, that would have been much tidier. So tomorrow mm. might be a bit disjointed on that note. Just to come back on what you said there, though, I, I agree with you to, a, to an extent, but I also think that the best comedy stands up to analysis and actually becomes funnier mm. when, when you start delving into it. So, and I think this really has the potential to go there. I just, I'm so excited to see what happens tomorrow because I, yeah, it started off so well. Uh, Eric, I saw a hand and then Lynn. Uh, yeah, there is that expression about, you know, um, you know, tragedy is something that happens to you, comedy is something that happens to someone else. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, Lynn. 
Um, I think another reason for Sarah's experience with um, with comedies, and we've talked about this before, is that complications are easier to set up than they are to resolve in a satisfactory way. So it's easier to make the mess than it is to clean it up. Endings are hard, is, uh, is basically kind mm -hmm. of what we've talked about before. And, and I'll just mention it again, because not everyone is gonna watch every one of these exploring sessions. Even uh, a later master of this sort of thing who was probably influenced by this particular text uh, ben Johnson, uh, who would, whose plays are like little machines, the way all the parts work together, his endings can be quite unsatisfying. The ending of The Alchemist is, is really quite unsatisfying. The ending of Volpone is quite unsatisfying. And even the end of, of Epicene, which is, was praised in the next century as being a perfect play, is a little ew. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> this character that you've been rooting for all this time turns out to be kind of a, a heartless shit. So and I think part of the experience is, is that, that they start out really funny is that complications are easier to set up than they are to resolve and endings are hard. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's uh, we're, we're coming, I think, also from a, a, a weird golden age, at least of survivals for comedy. Uh, you know, we've got within a year, we've got Respublica, which uh, we, we all agreed was was rather fabulous. Uh, Jack Juggler, I think, is a is a much smaller and simpler piece, but it's, it works very well. We've got Gamma Girton's Needles first iteration is coming out around this time. We've done that on the podcast as well. Full cast audio uh, adaptation is available um, and they all do quite similar things with their comedy. And they're all quite complex and dense and, uh, and are built like tanks. They're comedy tanks. Uh, whether this one turns out to be uh, as, as well structured as some of the, the others, um, you know, like Res, Res Publica and, uh, and Gamma Girton, um, there's a reason why these plays got picked up in the 20th century and got quite a good publishing history. Um, you know, you can find copies of Ralph Royster Doister all over the shop in, uh, in secondhand uh, bookshops. Um, I have heard many a tale and oft of um, really, really um, bad productions of, of this and similar plays. Um, and I think it's just simply, this is hard to do well as well. Yeah. You know, you need a you need team a good, who can yeah. do it well. You know, just turning up with some actors and just saying the words, this mm -hmm. play I can see dying very, very quickly um so um yeah you've got to put the work in people there's a lot more to be mined out of this and that's precisely why we're here all that remains is to thank all the wonderful readers for their wonderful work today and goodbye bye, bye. bye.